Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deidre, for the lovely in introduction. I am delighted to be here. This is um, my second trip to Ottawa, and I look forward to returning over and over again. I've already begun to uh, bring together a family of sorts, uh, thanks to my brother and my dear sister-in-law, uh, whose generous hospitality, I would say luxurious hospitality, I've been enjoying. A number of summers ago, I arrived at the archives of the Alliance Israelite Universelle in Paris, and I was met with extraordinary news. Archives that had been presumed to have been lost for 50 years had just been returned from Moscow. Now, you might wonder, why were archives being returned from Moscow uh, just recently? When the Nazis arrived in Paris in the Second World War, the first building they occupied was the building of the uh, archives of the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And they took all of the library and a large amount of archives, and they sent this material to Frankfurt in Germany. On the top floor of the Allianz archives, there was a huge room which belonged to the Secretaire General. And in this room were boxes and boxes of personal dossiers of members of the Allianz, teachers, where they were posted, when they were born, all sorts of personal um, information. And the Allianz, fearing for the safety of the material, but more importantly also for the safety of these individuals who were named, loaded all these dossiers and all this material onto boxes right before the Nazis arrived, put them on vans, and sent them to the free zone in France. And that's the last we know. So the rest is conjecture. But what seems to have been the case was that these archives were uh, taken by the Germans before they got to the free zone, that they were brought by the Germans to Berlin, that at the end of the war they surfaced, that the Soviets took them, and the Soviets removed them and brought them to Moscow, where they were put in the Soviet archives. And in contrast to most other archives, the Soviet archives were put together in order to prevent anyone from looking at the material. So these dossiers were in pristine condition. All this material was in pristine condition. Kilometers of it were returned um, 50 or so years later. And had this material been there when I began my project, my project would have taken much less time and probably would have gone in a very different direction. Before um, discussing my project, I'd like to introduce what, to you the Alliance Israelite Universelle, for those of you who don't know about this institution. In June 1860, the first summons for the Alliance was um, issued. And there were two catalysts for this summons. One was the Damascus blood libel in 1840, in which Jews were accused of murdering a monk um, for blood, for ritual purposes. And the Mortara kidnapping case in 1858, in which a young child was kidnapped by the Inquisition because it was assumed, maybe he was and maybe he wasn't, that he had been baptized by his nursemaid who, non-Jewish nursemaid, obviously, who had feared that he was going to die without having been baptized. And so these two incidents were the catalysts for a summons in 1860 by six highly acculturated French Jews who were determined to come to the aid of Jews throughout the world. And they were heeding, they believed, the rabbinic saying, call Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh, all Jews are responsible for one another. And let me quote the words for you of the call, because it'll give you a sense of not only what was motivating them, <clears throat> but how it resonated with 19th century French history, and also how it echoed the period of the revolution and the time when the Jews were emancipated for the first time ever in Europe. So this is just a brief couple of sentences from the call of the um, Allianz. If you believe that a great number of your co-religionists, overcome by 20 centuries of misery, of insults and prohibitions, can find again their dignity as men, win the dignity of citizens, 
If you believe that one should enlighten those who have been blinded and not abandon them, raise those who have been exhausted and not rest with pitying them, defend those who have been calumnied and not remain silent, rescue all those who have been persecuted and not only talk about the persecution. If you believe in all these things, Jews of the world, come hear our appeal, join our organization and give us your help. The enterprise had a twofold goal. Through diplomatic lobbying, they would come to the aid of persecuted Jews all over the world, in Switzerland, in Poland, in the rest of Eastern Europe, in North Africa, in the Middle East. And through the establishment of a network of elementary schools modeled after the École Primaire in France that had recently been established, through the establishment of a network of schools in North Africa and the Middle East, they would regenerate, and this is the word they used, it was a word that was used during the French Revolution as well, uh, and was part of the Enlightenment, they would regenerate the Jews of the world, or the Jews of North Africa and the Middle East, vocationally, spiritually, morally, culturally. By the First World War, the Alliance had more than 30,000 members worldwide, including a local committee in Keokuk, Iowa, and I had no idea where Keokuk, Iowa was, but there was a committee there. 43,700 students enrolled in 183 schools, which stretched from Tetuan in northern Morocco to Tehran in Iran. There were 12 of the schools in Palestine. And uh, a student of mine and I did an article recently on the um, dossiers that some of these Allianz schools sent to the Chicago World's Fair, which appeared alongside material from various colleges and universities in the United States. I first became interested in the Allianz. I had been working, as Deirdre said, on the 18th century and revolution and Bordeaux and what took me to the Allianz when I was preparing a review of a, bo a book of a friend of mine, Aaron Rodrigue, and I noticed a brief footnote in the text, and I'll quote you one sentence. So far, there has been only one study devoted to the female teachers of the Allianz, and the study listed was 13 pages long. So I immediately called Aaron, my friend, and I said, is this still the case? And he said, yes, and I said, wow. This, this is an amazing group of women. Uh, I'm really going to go and do some research and find out who they were, what their goals were, what they thought they were doing, what they accomplished. And he said, don't bother. There's really no good information, uh, and there's certainly no personal information on these teachers. It's all more or less formulaic. Um, so my brother will testify. I'm a rather stubborn soul. So I thought, well, I think I'm still going to go to Paris in the summer and see what the archives hold. So let me take one more detour before I share with you some of this information and tell you who were the teachers of the Alliance. So, sorry, between the, the warmth of outside and a delicious meal before and I'm a little thirsty. So the Alliance had originally ex expected that its teachers would come from France. And in the beginning, its teachers did come from a rabbinical school and from Alsace in France. But as the schools multiplied, the Allianz realized that there were very few French men and women who wanted to leave France and go live in the various towns and villages of North Africa and the Middle East. And so the Allianz proposed another solution, which was to take the brightest of the Orientals, they were called Orientals at the time by the Metropole, by France, which had somewhat of a pejorative meaning. Um, they would take the brightest of the Orientals, they would bring them to Paris at the age of 14, where they would study at an Ecole Normale for four years, and then these young boys and girls at the age of 18 would return to North Africa in the Middle East to found and to teach in these schools that the Alliance was setting up. And the Moscow archives that were returned so much later um, had in them the individual dossiers of these teachers, their medical reports, the letters from the parents giving them permission to uh, to go to Paris, um, every bit of information you could imagine, as well as the exams that they had to take, 
to be chosen to go and the grades that they received. So it was, there was a great deal of um, information for me later. Um, so four years after their stay in Paris, during which they never returned home, with teaching degrees as well as knowledge of Hebrew and Jewish history, these young people returned to North Africa and the Middle East. And they were really missionaries for the modernization of their fellow Jews. But they were also simultaneously its product and the vectors for its success. And paradoxically, they were also vectors for more successful integration of the Jews in France as well. Because to the extent that Jews living in North Africa and the Middle East were not seen positively by French, the French, it had an impact also on how Jews living in France were perceived. So it was a complicated mandate that these young boys and girls undertook. Not surprisingly, loneliness and the sense of being abandoned were probably the first experiences that these teachers had. And I'll just quote from one of the young women uh, who had recently arrived in her post. We disembark in a city of the Orient or of Africa, which is unknown to us. In effect, according to the laudable and prudent but not agreeable traditions of the Alliance's Central Committee, those who come from Haifa are sent to Smyrna, while the Tunisians are sent to Egypt. It is necessary to install oneself, look for a room, a pension. Neither mother nor older sister guides us. Besides, not having earned our first trimester salary, we have no funds. We are isolated and miserable, with no relations and no friends. Interrogate my colleagues, ask them if exhausted by the first weeks of teaching, not yet broken into a profession which taxes the brain no less than the lungs. They have not cried secretly in the evening alone in their room, furnished with the four traditional pieces of furniture bequeathed by the teacher whom they have just replaced. The teachers were not without direction. The Secretary General of the Alliance for many years, from the end of the 19th century till the day he died in 1934 in his office, um, was Jacques Bigard. And I refer to him in my mind as the Ministry of Education of One. And he micromanaged the Alliance in all of its aspects, including the lives of the Alliance teachers. And so he prepared for them based on a Frenchman, Payot's, um, basically his uh, detailed uh, reports. He prepared for the Alliance teachers a manual, which gave them the syllabi they were to follow for each of their classes, the rules they were fo to follow, regulations, and the fines that they would endure, uh, or worse, if they failed to follow them. And as an example, all teachers were to continue with their own studies, maintain their facility in French, practice their religious duties scrupulously. They were not to publish anything in journals without communicating it to the Alliance. And even during school holidays, we're not to leave the school without permission from the Alliance. And they also made clear that the Alliance would not look happily on people who were getting married when they didn't have the means to do so. And needless to say, they were to ask permission from the Alliance if they were planning to get married. Impor important for my research as well, the teachers were to write to the Alliance reports once a month detailing the community, the school, the students, what was going on in all respects. And the assistant teachers were to write twice, um, every two months, bi-monthly. Uh, correspondence was in French, and the stationery was a special stationery. So this was what Aaron was referring to when he said, you're not really going to find a lot, because these are reports. And they're very interesting ethnographically, but they're not going to give us personal insight into these teachers. Significantly, a teacher's failure to follow the rules and the regulations, as I said, carried fines, decrease in salary, change of post, usually a less desirable one, or worse of all, <coughs> dismissal. And if dismissed, the teacher would have to pay the Allianz back for the education she had received. That's the introduction. Back to my summer in Paris. What did I find, and what is my project? So what I decided to do when I arrived in Paris was to arbitrarily choose five women and find out all I could find out about them through the archives. And the Alliance sent the women 
to um, three schools in Paris for their normal school education, Madame Isaac, Madame Velcan, and Ecole Bishopsheim. And I thought that Madame Isaac ran the best school. It was the most rigorous school. So I chose all five from this school. And the first woman I chose was a young woman named Lucy Avadia, who had been born in Salonika, who was sent to Alexandria, then to Rhodes and Bursa. And I found a great deal of her correspondence, and it was fascinating. The second person I came across was a woman named Claire Benchimol, who came from Tetuan in northern Morocco. And at the time, I didn't realize that the family was a relatively well-known family, and that Delacroix, when he had come to Tangier, uh, not so long before that, had um, uh, uh, been staying in the Benchamal family of Tangier, and some of his portraits are of the women, the Benchamal women from <coughs> Tangier. In any event, I didn't know any of that. I just started reading about Claire Benchamal, who was born in Tetuan in 1870. And it turned out that she was the brightest student that Madame Isaac had ever encountered. And when she took the normal school exams that all um, students took who wanted to be normal school teachers in France, uh, when she took these exams, she scored the highest of anyone. So everyone was shocked that a young girl from Morocco could top all these French-born um, men and women. She returned to Tetuan after she received her uh, teaching diploma and ultimately married a man named Meyer Levy had three children, um, uh, worked in the school to create a new school building, enlarged the student population, <coughs> engaged in diplomatic um, lobbying. So she was an extraordinary woman, brilliant, ferociously independent, and highly articulate. And I have to say, I became attached to her. I just was, I, I, there was something about her letters that really resonated with me. And I would take the bus every morning to the archives and I would be wondering, what am I going to find out about her now? And one of the things I knew was that there was one doctor in Tetuan at the time named Dr. Berliowski, who had come from Eastern Europe, an amazing, amazing man. He was, um, he hadn't planned to stay, but he ended up staying in Morocco. And every time she had a child, he saved her life. Uh, she had fibroids and was bleeding, and he had the most up-to-date equipment. Uh, so as I would be riding on the bus, I was always afraid I was going to lose her to something. And lose her in, to childbirth uh, was on my mind. And then a, a situation erupted in the community, and um, she and her husband were no longer able to maintain the authority that they uh, had been able to in the community, and I'll talk about that in a minute later. And so they were forced to take another post, which was in Tripoli. And immediately I realized there was no Dr. Berlioski in Tripoli. In fact, there was no doctor for the Jews in Tripoli, and that I was really afraid I was going to lose her, which in fact was the case. And shortly after she arrived in Tripoli, she died in childbirth. And let me quote to you her sister's response to losing Claire, and you'll get a feeling of what I was beginning to discover in these letters. Words are too weak to describe the intensity of our sadness. We are driven crazy, and I am still asking myself if this terrible death is not just a nightmare will, which will soon be over. How do we answer these poor little orphans who cry for their mother and who tear one's heart out by their childish logic? How do we draw the moral force necessary to withstand this severe test? How do we console ourselves with such an irreparable loss? The entire city is in mourning for my poor and dear sister, and all her pupils are crying for her. My dear mother, already so sorely tried, forces herself to hide her sadness in order not to revive ours. So as you can see, I was finding personal letters. In fact, I found thousands kept together by rusting straight pins. Nobody had read them. And they had come into Paris, been put aside, and no one had looked at them from the time they had arrived. So based on this veritable treasure trove, I decided to explore the goals, self-identity, and struggles and accomplishments of the women teachers of the Alliance. But 
I didn't want to leave Claire, and I didn't want to leave her family, and I didn't want to leave the four children whom she had left. And so I decided, rather than doing a global study of the women teachers of the Alliance, I would do a multi-generational portrait of Claire's family, which included Claire, her sisters, Sol, Hasiba, and Alegrina, and Claire's three daughters, who also became Alliance teachers. And just for good measure, I decided to throw in a cousin, who was really very interesting, and a student of Claire's. Between them, these women founded and directed Alliance schools in 12 different cities, mostly in Morocco, but some also in the Ottoman Empire. Now, obviously, I do not have the time to talk to you about all these women and to talk to you about all of the issues that they uh, confronted. So what I'd like to do is highlight a few of the issues that they confronted, gendered issues that they confronted, as well as some of the unanticipated um, and unintended consequences of their mission. But before I do so, one slight additional digression. I want to introduce you just to the women I'll be quoting, whose letters I'll be quoting. So there's Claire, whom you've already met briefly, who was very serious, a disciplinarian, as I said, ferociously independent. She was very proud of, of her culture, of Tetuan, of the Moroccan culture, of the culture of Tetuan, very fiercely proud of it. And she directed schools in Tetuan and then in Tripoli. Her sister, Hasiba, was six years younger, and she was born in Tangier. She was the founder and director of the school in Fez, director of schools in Lahash, and in some uh, schools in the Balkans, in Macedonia, and finally in Casablanca, from which she retired in 1924. Hasiba was very different from Claire, physically small, quite beautiful, um, very intense, emotionally intense, sadly <coughs> afflicted with the same disease her father had, a bipolar disease, and so spent some time in a Paris institution. <laughs> she was utterly brilliant, um, but lacked, not but, and lacked um, Claire's affection for Tetuan culture. Hasiba was more um, engrossed in French culture, French civilization, um, not, uh, not always happily looking at the culture around her. Um, I was, as I was saying this, thinking of, of an aside which I'll share with you. Very recently, I received an email from a young man from Bogota, Colombia. And it turns out he's Hasiba's great, great grandson. And we've become very close. They've embraced me as family. I knew more about their family than they did, given all the letters that I've been reading. And um, in one of our conversations, he mentioned to me that um, his aunt, whom I had been Skyping with, uh, the, the aunt's um, daughter had uh, recently committed suicide. <coughs> And I said to him, I said, David, you know it runs in your family, at which point I proceeded to talk about all the members of the Benjamin family who had had issues psychologically. And he said, he wrote me a note and he said, you don't know what you've given to us because we took responsibility for this and now we understand much better what our family sort of uh, background is. So it's an aside with, uh, with Hasiba. The other sister, Alegrina, whose letter I quoted, um, uh, when Claire had died. It was much younger. She was born in Tetuan in 1885. She directed schools in Tripoli in what was then called Mogador, now is Esuera, and Casablanca. And Claire was so happy to have Alegrina with her because Alegrina was upbeat. Um, she, was, uh, she had a joie de vivre in her 70s. She was driving around Casablanca in a convertible. I mean, she, she really was quite, quite a character, quite a woman. And uh, she was the most successful in many ways of the, uh, the, the sisters in teaching. And in fact, Bigar himself, who rarely gave compliments to anyone, had to admit when he went to North Africa for the first time in the 20s that she was quite a stellar teacher. The last two... Um, are uh, um, Masoudi Pariente, who was a student of Claire's, and she was a teacher assistant and director in Tangier, Tetuan, Beirut, Mazagan, Fez, and Rabat. And uh, she, she was, uh, came from a rather privileged Sephardi family. She was a very interesting woman, a talented pianist who would carry her piano with her wherever she went. 
until it was destroyed uh, uh, in 1912 in Fez. And she was the aunt of one of Morocco's greatest writers, Edmond El Malet. I don't know if you know the name. And uh, a few years ago, shortly before he died, I was with him in Morocco, and I asked him about his aunt. And he didn't really want to talk about her. And then all of a sudden, he said, but I have to, and out poured these memories of her tutoring him when he had asthma, and the connections flowed. So that was, that's my list of women whom I'll be referring to for the rest of the talk. All of them married Allianz teachers. All of them, except for Allegrina, had children of their own. Allegrina, out of affection and love for Claire, married her widower, who is 17 years older than she, and raised Claire's four children as her own. Uh, all lived through wars and epidemics of the plague, cholera, and typhoid. Allegrina, Chasiba, and Masodi Parienti nearly died from typhoid. All suffered miscarriages. All four were intellectually gifted and fortunately for me, consummate letter writers. So with that as the massive introduction, let me highlight a few of the issues that they confronted in their um, mission as teachers of the Allianz schools. So one of the issues was child marriage. And it was a dilemma because if the teachers admitted children, could be 9, 10, 11 year old children, into the school who were married, they were condoning a practice they eschewed. And if they didn't, they were condemning these young girls to illiteracy. So it was a, a dilemma. But the situations in the various towns, for example, in Morocco, were very different. In Fez, for example, child marriage was really practiced by the very wealthy. And Hasiba, who declared in 1900 that she was a feminist, um, Hasiba was sure that it was the fathers who were behind this. But it wasn't. It was the mothers who did not want to give up the arrangement of these early marriages. Claire also confronted the issue of child marriage and whether you can admit a student. And Claire, too, made the decision not to. But the situation in Tetuan was very different. In Tetuan, child marriages were almost always arranged only by the poor who could not afford to wait for their daughters to get old enough because they didn't have a dowry and the child was more valuable. So let me give you a quote from Claire and you'll get a sense of the struggle that these teachers had over the um, decision not to let children stay in school if they were married. Miriam Schwaron has left the school today. In spite of her youth, her parents are going to marry her in three months. The poor child does not want to separate herself either from her classmates or from the teachers. And the day that she said goodbye to us, she cried warm tears. So much did she regret leaving. So Claire decided to seek out Miriam's mother. Why, I asked her, was she so pressed to marry her daughter? What else can I do, she explained. Today someone came requesting my daughter without demanding a dowry or trousseau. We are poor, and I cannot afford to wait, only to find that I myself must then search for a husband. How does one respond to such reasoning, Claire asked herself. Civilization alone will be able to make this disappear, but we will have to wait so very long. Everything goes slowly, but this will go at the speed of a tortoise. And subsequently, Claire would describe in letters some of these very young mothers hiding in the classroom in the back so they could just get a little education. And Claire was quite right about the speed of a tortoise. Unfortunately, children of school age in many countries are still denied their basic right to education. Not, however, in Morocco, where there is a law today that no one can marry uh, before 18 years of age. The, another gendered issue was teaching Hebrew. The schools that were established by the Alliance were you know, modeled after the primary schools in France, but they were also comparable to Jewish day schools. So included in a very rigorous French curriculum, and the schools were um, taught, I mean, the whole curriculum was in French. Uh, included, however, was also the study of Hebrew and of Bible and Jewish history. So teaching Hebrew, um, that was a problem because it was very hard to find rabbis who were willing to teach Hebrew. Uh, 
Uh, and according to Claire and Hasiba, very hard to find rabbis who were both willing to teach Hebrew and knew how to teach it. That it was a hodgepodge. They wanted it taught in a way that they could translate for the, for the children and that it would make sense that the prayers were in a kind of order, but this was not the case. So they both bemoaned the situation. Um, in Tetuan, it was exacerbated by the fact that Tetuan was um, a city which had emigration um, increasing over the years. Many, many of the young men were leaving for Algeria and then subsequently for um, Argentina, for example. And the language in Tetuan in northern Morocco was Spanish, so it was very easy for these men, young men to go and seek their livelihood in, um, in, for example, Argentina. So there were fewer men available, in addition to not finding many who thought that uh, young girls should learn Hebrew. Hasiba had a slightly different problem in Fez. In Fez, it, there was no emigration, but what there was was a much more conservative society. And so the, um, nobody wanted uh, their daughters exposed to a young male. So it meant that you could only have an old man teaching Hebrew. <laughs> so listen to what Hasiba decides to do and how she resolves the situation. We cannot engage a young rabbi for the school nor one of middle age, for the parents would take their daughters out of the school. We have to have an old man. I fear old was a lot younger than I am, but in any event, we have to have an old man. And Monsieur Dizini is the only one who, in spite of his years, can still work. His method of teaching does not satisfy me. I cannot trust him with a class, for he is incapable of establishing discipline. So she has a solution. I therefore have him teach Hebrew during dressmaking under my personal surveillance. <laughs> Another of the areas of issues that the teachers confronted um, were relations with the local communities. Um, there was really obviously a strain between the community's traditional values and the values held by these young women once they had spent four years in France and had returned. Um, and this created a tension in a variety of ways. For example, Claire there were many students in the school who were impoverished, and so she wanted to provide lunches for these students, otherwise they literally were starving. And um, she went to collect money for the food that would be prepared in the women's school. And the Talmud Torah in Tetuan was happy to give um, money and food, but only to feed the boys, not to feed the girls, even though the food was being prepared in the girls' school. It was also a barrier of language. Um, Claire and Hasiba and Allegrina's brother, um, Isaac, knew Arabic, but they did not. They knew Spanish, and they knew French, and they knew Hebrew from their studies, but they did not know Arabic. So when Hasiba went to Fez, she didn't have a clue what the mothers of her students were saying, because they spoke only Arabic, and she did not. So she got a fair number of things wrong as a result. There was also the difficulty of disciplining students. And um, for a woman to discipline a male, a, a man's daughter was unacceptable to many men. And so discipline was not always easy. And in Claire's case, she had forbidden the young student to return to school because the young student had absconded with the dressmaking um, model mannequin and had stolen it basically from the school. So this irate father marched to the school to confront Claire, was held back from physically hurting her, but he did cause her to have a, um, a miscarriage. And it was this incident when he came into the school and Claire was left without the support of the rabbi of the community who was very ill at the time and dying. And so this irate father created a lot of um, support for himself among other frustrated um, newly arrived immigrants to Tetuan. And as a result, the Alliance decided they had to send Claire and her husband away because they no longer had the moral authority to remain in, um, in Tetuan. And that was when they were, in Claire's words, exiled to Tripoli. So what were the relations of these teachers with the Alliance, which is a complex and complicated uh, question. As one were, would predict, they were not only complicated but contested and subject to change over time. 
the teachers themselves arrived in Paris at the age of 14. They were still kids. So their relationship with the Alliance was one of dependency. But this would change as these women grew to be ferociously independent women. Um, but also there was a change in Alliance leadership. Once Bigard left, uh, things were no, not as personal and they were far more bureaucratic. There was also the beginning of the ties with colonial authorities, which changed the nature of the Alliance, the Alliance's mission, and ultimately also affected the individual schools. And uh, you also had the maturation of the teachers themselves over time. So let me highlight a few of the examples of the relationship between the teachers and then talk about why <laughs> they became this way and the unintended uh, consequences for the Alliance. As students in Paris, as I said, the teachers had a relationship with the Alliance as dutiful daughters. Everything was paid for by the Alliance. If they needed books, the Alliance paid for them. If they needed a bra, the Alliance paid for it. So there was, it was sort of parental, clearly. And this is a letter written in 1908 to Bigard, which highlights that dynamic. But also, if you think about it, and it's a very short letter, just a few sentences, what they're saying they don't do, you suspect they probably do do. So they say, we are not unaware of how caring you are for us. We are separated from our parents, yet thanks to your protection, we do not find ourselves alone. Know that your visits give us great pleasure, for they are just like the visits of a father to his children. The name of the Secretaire of the Alliance does not frighten us, for we do not experience your protection as tyrannical. That's sort of interesting. Why do they say that? <laughs> but this does not mean that we do not hold you in great, great respect, and it's signed, children desirous of pleasing you. That doesn't last very long. That's only when they're, when they're children. Subsequently, as adults, none of the teachers escaped feeling underappreciated by the Alliance. And the burdens on them were enormous. They endured wars, epidemics, responsibility for caring for their own families, lack of sufficient financial support from the Alliance, and abysmal ignorance on the part of the Alliance. You know, the leaders happily ensconced in Paris, uh, abysmal ignorance about what was going on in the ground. And the teachers often lost their way. They had doubts about the goals of the Alliance, that the Alliance had set for them, whether they could fulfill them, and even more importantly, whether they were the, really the right goals in the first place. And this is Allegrina in 1919 as she's leaving Tripoli. And in many ways, she was the most thoughtful about this. There is a particular sadness in leaving Tripoli. Patience, energy, perseverance, and unfailing devotion, these are the qualities which made our stay almost eternal. We have worked so hard and struggled a great deal. Yet what will remain of all this? Will one sincerely love what we have done in the end? Nevertheless, and in striking contrast to their French counterparts, the institutrice of the metropole, striking contrast to them, as well as the expectations and intentions of the Alliance, the women teachers, especially the pioneering generation, which is the generation I've been talking to you about, emerged as ferociously independent, autonomous women willing to challenge the Alliance, the Central Committee, and the colonial authorities. So let me sort of head towards the end by giving you some examples and answering, at least briefly, why they, were, why they became so ferociously independent. So these are a few examples. In the fall of 1893, Claire was describing to Bigard the unrest in the area around Tetuan. There was a, an incident with Melilla, Spanish defeat. She was afraid there might be some civil war, and she feared for the well-being of the school and the children. And from his more comfortable position in the 9th arrondissement in Paris, Bigard tried to calm her fears. And he complained as well that he would like to see, quote unquote, more courage from the director of the school. Now, Claire's response was one of annoyance uh, and even beyond annoyance. And this is what she says. I see from, she's 19, by the way. I see from what you have said that my letter has led you to believe that natural female weakness alone has led me to write to you in this manner. Do not believe for one moment that I exaggerate the situation. It suffices to be here for a few days to get an idea of the alarming state of the population. I can say without flattering myself too much that in this situation I have been 
and I still am braver than many of the men. <laughs> Hasiba uh, was accused by Bigar of lacking flexibility and tact in her negotiations with the Jewish community in Larash. And she barely hid, hid her annoyance with this one sentence. Have I arrived after five years as director and with all my experience in the service to receive from you this reproach so little merited? So these are young women sent back to North Africa, presumably under the control of the Secretary General in Paris, who are returning to him with, you don't understand it, you don't get it, you don't know what's going on, and we know better. Uh, here's another example from Misodi Pariente, who was in... Um, Mazagan at the time, and um, she wanted a, an assistant to come and help her. And the Alliance was reluctant. Um, so they sort of thought that she was not using good judgment to ask someone to come when things were so precarious. And this is her response. You express fear for the security of a young girl who would come all alone to Morocco. She would not be alone in Mazagan. She would be with me, staying with me if it is necessary. If the situation becomes so aggravated as to present serious dangers, we will not remain ourselves, and my assistant would leave with me. This lack of tranquility could last for years. Is it because of this that you are going to suspend our work in Morocco, the appropriation by her that it is our work? We must continue to work now, there now, more than ever. So she owned the mission, but owning it, she also was letting him know that he wasn't wise in his decision. And my favorite example, uh, also Masodi Parienti, she established a domestic training school in Rabat. And the, by then there was the protectorate in Morocco, the French protectorate. And she understood that the French did not like ind the indigenous population, which included the Jews. And they were making her life miserable in a variety of ways. They were augmenting her work, reducing her personnel, paying her less than her non-Jewish peers. And ultimately, she lost the position in 1922. And she refused to be silenced. Uh, and so she decided to demand that she get paid and also um, that any costs that she had in bringing her case would be, um, she would be reimbursed. And she received every, everything she requested. And she sent a long, detailed description to the Alliance, but I'll give you the last sentence. One never anticipated that this little institutrice was going to file a complaint against the director of the public instruction, Beaux-Arts and Antiquité, but one sees everything these days, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> So how do we account for this? And you know, I could go on and I won't. <laughs> it's getting late and I want time for question and answer. But how can we account for the autonomy of the Alliance's institutrice? Well, there are a lot of explanations, I think. Let me share with you a few. One is that they were a self-selecting group. The young women in this pioneering generation, there were no options for them. If they came from poor families, there was nothing they could do other than go into service you know, be made of sorts. And so the appeal was to these young women to become teachers, and then they became the support for the family often. Um, so this is one example of why. The other is the Alliance was dependent on these women in a way that they were not on the men, because the Alliance did not have a clue. European Jews did not really have much of a clue of what life was like for Jewish women in North Africa and the Middle East. They didn't have much understanding at all. And so these teachers were auto and ethnographers. They were providing Paris with a great deal of information. And that gave them a certain independence and a feeling of autonomy. Also importantly, their four-year study in France was highly influential for them. It exposed them to the early years of French feminism. Remember I said to you, Hasiba defined, described herself as a feminist in 1900. And um, she wrote also, I must confess that as a woman and feminist, the practice of mourning at the birth of a daughter revolts me. So she was a feisty feminist. Uh, so the emergence of feminism in the metropole was influential. And also at the same time, there was what was called the new woman 
emerging in France, uh, the Belle Epoque. And these new women weren't necessarily feminists, but they were challenging um, female identity in a variety of ways, including sartorially. And the Alliance teachers were very much influenced by this, and the, most of the women set up workshops along with the schools. And in these workshops, they replicated these fashions, which were really liberating in a variety of ways. So this was also it was obviously not the intention of the Alliance that these teachers emerge as autonomous, feisty women. But the Alliance itself embraced feminism, as did all good Republicans in France at the time. But it was a particular kind of feminism. It was an equality indifference, indifference feminism. And it believed that gender relations were an indicator of a society's level of civilization, the Alliance did. So it supported this equality indifference indifference feminism. But it was, let me give you an example, it was a call, for example, to educate the Jewish girls of the Orient to become the type of mother this new generation required. So it was a very traditional kind of feminism, which in France led to a great deal of stability and basically generate the next generation of women live lives comparable to their mothers. But even this conservative um, equality and difference feminism, when brought by these women to North Africa, had a destabilizing effect. And it was far more radical. And so when one of the women was talking about what she intended for the changes to take place in the household, she said, to make of our young girls women different from their mothers, who will no longer be at the mercy of their husband's whims. So this is a, what happened to this traditional feminism when it got, you know, when it, when it, when it was seated in, the, in the, the quote unquote Orient was very different from what took place in Paris. Also, the Alliance's appropriation of this kind of feminism was linked to its political self-representation in France. And for the teachers, when they embraced feminism, it was personal liberation. And so it was translated very differently by them. Finally, it was not the intention of the Alliance that these teachers play an independent role in the imperial turn of the 19th and 20th century. And it's true that after four years in Paris, the teachers returning were looking at life around them in North Africa through an Orientalist lens. There is no doubt about that. And often out of fatigue or more, they would refer to their students even go so far sometimes as to refer to them as petit sauvage. But once they, once they arrived and stayed in a particular place for a while, they rejected this and sought instead to defy the Alliance because they felt that the Alliance and the Orientalist vision underestimated the potential of the women they were teaching. And they wanted much more for their students than what the metropole had in mind for them. So let me just give you a couple of examples. How were they going to defy the Alliance in uh, empowering their students in ways that the Alliance basically influenced by an, you know, a typical metropole view of the colonies was not in favor of? One was the, uh, the teachers decided they really wanted to teach history, dates, facts bring in actually what took place rather than moral lessons, which was rather um, radical at the time. They also imported sewing machines. The Alliance thought that the young girls could learn to sew by hand, but the teachers bought sewing machines. They established cottage industries by importing knitting machines as well. The defiance extended to their own lives. They did not bother to ask the Alliance whether they could marry someone or not. They merely informed the Alliance that they were getting married. <laughs> and in addition, which is, you know, I'm not going to illustrate it now, but the, by undertaking the mission that the Alliance teachers were given, they also acquired status and authority in the communities that they served. Claire was uh, very much involved in Tetuan uh, diplomatically and engaged with um, various institutions in, in Tetuan. So this empowered the teachers. Uh, the very fact that they were there uh, undertaking this mission 
created a position for them, which then they used to, at times, defy exactly what the alliance intended. So in conclusion, the pioneering generation of alliance institutrices, in many respects, agents of the French empire, albeit never considered French, had an enduring impact on the young girls of the Orient, especially in the areas of literacy, eradication of child marriage, familiarity with Jewish tradition and history, and the acquisition of skills required to earn a living and maintain a modern home. And the question that I leave, with, leave you with is, did they also leave footprints beyond their own religious community? And the answer is perhaps. There's a quote from a Moroccan Muslim woman, and she says, everything new pertaining to women we owe to Jewish girls who opened the breaches by letting us believe change was possible. And this may be hyperbolic, but the assertion beckons us to explore as well the broader legacy of the teachers of the Alliance. Thank you.